I'm John Batchelor. I welcome my colleague, Professor Stephen F. Cohen, New York University, Princeton University. EastWestAccord.com is the website Steve and I have been discussing for years the possibility of avoiding the new Cold War that we're deep in to right now. And one way out, possible way out, was the unlikely election of Donald J. Trump to be president-elect of the United States of America. And here we are on the eve or the precipice or the day of, whatever the correct metaphor is. Steve, a very good evening to you. It's possible, it's possible with Donald J. Trump in the White House to go another way with the Kremlin. They're having their tea at the Kremlin right now. What are they entertaining? What can they dream? Good evening to you, Steve. Well, they assume she would win. So like most of America, they're probably... What time is it now? It's eight, eight o'clock in the yeah. morning. Yes. Well, I'm not sure. Maybe nine because we went on daylight savings time. But they, they're having their vodka and their tea this morning. Uh, the the smart guys there who study America and they got a lot of them said that he had no chance. So uh, they're they're puzzled. You know, John, uh, this doesn't disrupt our conversation we've had for three years about the new Cold War. Uh, it gives us a chance to think about it. Let me let me remind you of one thing in case you missed it, because normally we talk on Tuesday night, and I would have brought it up. On November 5th, NBC reported, and it was a well-documented report, that the White House is preparing some kind of cyber attack on Russia. This is in reaction to the utterly fact-free allegations that Russia has been hacking our elections. Uh, but when you tell Russia we're preparing a cyber attack on you, for them it's like a nuclear attack. There's no precedent for this. So tension is very high in Moscow, and it's a very dire and reckless moment. So then here comes this possible election return. And I would say whether Trump wins or loses very narrowly, the three points I would make to you now are valid, or at least worth thinking about. First point is this, and this upset me more than anything uh, because I'm of a certain generation, that Mrs. Clinton's campaign played this McCarthyite Kremlin baiting, Putin baiting of Trump for three months, saying that Trump was an agent of the Kremlin. Basically, she ran against not uh, Trump and uh, Pence, but Trump and Putin. They did this on purpose. They fed all these rumors. It was an elite project, and I think what happened tonight tells us it didn't play with the voters. It wasn't this toxic explosive that they had launched against Trump to bring him down. It seems to have played no role whatsoever. So we might conclude that like the new Cold War, this terrible relationship with Russia is not something that comes from the people. It comes from our elite, bipartisan. And the Washington Post did a poll. I don't know if you saw this the other day. And it turns out that 67%, I think that's right, it might have been 60, but 60 or 67% of Americans poll dislike Putin and dislike Russia, but want the United States to cooperate with Russia against terrorists in Syria. Now, that's been the cutting-edge issue, you remember, we, that it was a plan, then it fell apart, but that has been the issue in the White House, should we cooperate with Russia militarily against the Islamic State or ISIS in Syria, and the White House decided no, or DOD, the Department of Defense, decided no, but 60% of Americans want that, so there is some hope that the Americans... American voters understand American national security better than our professional national security experts. The second thing is that, assuming I'm even only half right in how dire the situation is with Russia, closer to war than any time we've been since the Cuban Missile Crisis, we desperately, desperately need a discussion of our Russia policy, and we need to ask, have we, the United States, Washington, contributed to this new Cold War? Because the, the narrative is that only Putin is responsible. And it's been almost impossible, except on the John Bassler show, to get that discussion going. Now, what Mrs. Clinton did with this neo-McCarthyism may make public discussion even more difficult, because they've got the reflex in place now that anybody who says, well, maybe Russia is not entirely responsible, they say you're an apologist for Putin, and they, they delegitimize you. On the other hand, if Trump wins, or even comes very close, it may open up space because he ran as a kind of detente candidate. You remember he said we should cooperate with Putin, and right. I don't think he's entirely wrong. And in a way, if you put words in Trump's mouth that he couldn't think to put in his own mouth, 
Trump ran in the Republican uh, Republican tradition of pro detente presidents. Eisenhower pursued detente, Nixon, of course, and eventually Reagan. He could have said that he never did, but he did run in that tradition. So maybe even if he doesn't win, but just loses by a point or two, he's created space for us since the Kremlin baiting didn't hurt him to begin this conversation. And the, though I don't rule out the possibility that if he wins. Uh, particularly the liberal institutions like MSNBC and the Washington Post will blame Putin for his victory or say Putin was responsible for her defeat. But it's nonsense. But the last point I would make, and I don't know if you agree, I'd be interested, that there's been this most motif for almost three months, building to a crescendo the last two or three weeks, that Putin, Russia, are despoiling our democracy by degrading our presidential election. You get this all the time. Yes. My answer to that is no. We did this all by ourselves. The Russians had nothing to do with Trump's nomination. The Russians had nothing to do that she was one of the worst presidential candidates in history. Uh, even though Trump had these tor- very high negatives, in the end, people may prefer him to her. That's what we did. We set this up. It had nothing to do with Russia and Putin. And I remember... You're old enough, John. You remember, was it little Abner, Pogo? You remember Pogo? Yes, it's us. It's yeah, always us. I, I saw the enemy. Yes, and, and the enemy is us. And the enemy is us. We've been our own enemy in this presidential, this, this toxicity. Uh, but I do think that you have at least raised one bright note, whether he wins or just comes in second. It sure looks like a win right now, Steve. Well, I don't know. You know, we've seen Yeah, I know. Before. I know. I mean, but, but okay, so say he wins. If he wins, you know, those of us, I didn't support Trump, but those of us who desperately believe that the number one issue facing us is the danger in the new Cold War can say, as President-elect Trump pointed out, we need to begin to cooperate with Russia in areas where our vital... Well, vital well is, this, is, this, is this the miracle then, Steve? If this gives a well, way to launch a new dialogue to change from the Obama direction, which was confrontation and Cold War. See, here's the problem. We have 30 seconds, Steve. In the past, most people who called themselves liberals, or faintly on the left, were supportive of detente with Russia. Today, all of them are against it. They're against it. And the conservatives who, who oppose Trump are also against it. So we need to find uh, a kind of social constituency in our elite that will entertain this debate. It's possible that Trump will be that constituency. Professor Stephen F. Cohen, New York University, Princeton University. EastWestAccord.com is the website to watch for updates on the new Cold War. And tonight, a break in the weather. Warmer, with winter coming on. President-elect Trump, not yet, but in the landing pattern. I'm John Batchelor.